Thank you all. I uh, hope you enjoyed your time together, getting caught up and visiting. And uh, let's give the community house a round of applause for a fabulous lunch. Um, we have a rather unusual agenda today. Um, by design, but we are going to take um, a bit of a privilege and modify it a little bit. We're going to delay the chancellor's report until after we hear the committee reports and consider the consent agenda items. And um, so uh, we will come back um, after the af after these um, these reports and, and then go from there. We have a couple of critical. Uh, votes coming up and uh, from the nominating committee as well as from uh, the FAHR. So at this time, Marjorie, if we can turn it to the um, items. The um, yes, committee. and I need to pull up my um, policy uh, 2100. But the um, draft minutes are enclosed in your packet for informational, and the draft minutes came from our August 15th meeting right before the great beginning of the school year. And they sh we hope they'll be uh, good enough to be approved in the November 9th meeting, and I will think about you guys. Well, <laughs> I have a motion to approve the executive committee minutes. Um, so moved. Okay. okay. So moved. The second. Second. And all in favor say aye. Aye. All righty. Thank you. Well, the draft was then draft. approved. I'm nice. <laughs> I brought that up. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I didn't quite. I didn't. I thought I had. Yep. 55 minutes. Yes. To do it at least. <laughs> <laughs> so in um, 2100, I am going to be looking for the uh, general counsel to help walk me through this information. Um, in the informational packet, it talked about section um, 202 and the changes that are recommended uh, from a policy perspective. I would sort of like to talk, have you highlight the impact of why we're doing Sure, this. so uh, every year the, the executive committee is charged with reviewing our bylaws and, and to see if there are any changes to be made. They can't make the changes. Those changes can only be made by the board. Uh, and one change that we suggest making this year has to do with section 202, which is the special and emergency meetings and the notice provisions that were in that uh, section originally really didn't work out uh, or, or make much sense in terms of the timing of how these special and emergency meetings would be scheduled. So we've uh, rewritten that provision. It matches more now with uh, provisions, similar provisions in, 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 among the system, sister institutions, excuse me. Um, so it's really just a technical change regarding the notice of these meetings. And while we were considering that change, it came up at the executive committee meeting um, that in section 103, uh, the names of the standing committees were outdated. Uh, they didn't really match the, the names of those committees as they exist today, so we should, they recommend that you change those to bring them into conformance with the committees that exist now. Um, so the executive committee considered these changes and voted to recommend them to the board for its approval. And um, do I have a motion to make those changes that are recommended by the executive committee? So Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Great. All right. Um, Hugh Holston and Tom Looney's absence today. I understand you're going to give the highlights of the deep committee report. Yes. From the distance education and extended programs committee, we had a wonderful subcommittee meeting, and I'll cover our, our, our highlights as an outcome. Uh, first, by the end of the 2016-17 school year, we had 1,293 middle and high school students from 93 counties and had at least one NCSSM residential or distance education course uh, on their high school transcript. So that's really pretty incredible. Uh, we also reached more than 21,500 students and nearly 4,000 teachers through uh, direct products and services in the 2016-2017 school year. From a digital standpoint, uh, our outreach continues to grow at about 15% per year. Uh, we tracked 19,000 individual additions to our video playlist 
which is an indication that these videos are being assigned in classes or used in a series of, by students for academic preparation, which is exactly what we want them to do. I uh, also want to say thanks uh, for the hard work and determination of our library staff uh, and with support from the ITS. Uh, our students in the IVC courses are not able to access the same library databases as any NCSSM students, so we brought them up to parity. Uh, we also have several new online courses in production for the spring to include race, ethics, and leadership, organic chemistry, and entrepreneurship. Uh, our IVC program also seeks to grow enrollments this spring by adding additional offerings of uh, honors computer science and also introducing the honors robotics to our course catalog. Uh, moving on to the Summer Accelerator, another successful year. This year we served roughly 450 students, which is about a 25% increase over last year and operating for the first time summer programs on two campuses simultaneously with the addition of the Brevard College. And a lot of thanks goes to Paige Lamel for helping out with that effort. We also doubled uh, the number of underrepresented minority students participating in the accelerator from uh, 31 in 2016 to 68 in 2017. And if you include the students participating in other programs supported by the summer program team, we're now supporting nearly 300 underrepresented minority students. In 2018, we plan to serve uh, at least 500 students on those two campuses. And, uh -oh. uh, let me also add that uh, in addition to the summer accelerator, our summer programs include our Step Up to STEM, uh, a FIRST Robotics training camp serving students in underserved areas of the state, a camp for the visually impaired and blind, and also the ENC STEM program, that's the Eastern North Carolina STEM program, that's been highlighted by Grayson Cooper, who was, who was here earlier, he might be gone now, uh, in partnership with the Northampton County Schools and also with our regular other programs. So we're engaged with Accelerator, other summer programs. Uh, the trend lines are, are good, and we expect them to stay in good stead. Any questions or, or thoughts? Thank you. I see that. Back to you, Tom. Thank you. Elisa, okay. institutional advancement. Great. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion uh, this past Tuesday, uh, really centered around two of our strategic initiatives. Um, the first initiative was to increase and diversify our resources of revenue and, and our resources in general. Um, and the second was uh, strategy number five, to improve communications and public relations and marketing. So the three things I was going to just highlight from that discussion today uh, are centered around those strategic initiatives. Um, First of all, before I even go there, I want to welcome Stephanie Bass to the uh, Institutional Advancement Committee. We're really excited about having her on board. Um, and in addition, we have the new Executive Director, uh, who I'd like Brock just to say a few words about uh, and introduce her to uh, our, our board. Sure, we are really pleased in advancement to have uh, run our development team and led by April Horton, who is from uh, Right on the road in Lenore, and um, April comes to us uh, sort of in reverse. She came most recently from Carnegie Mellon University, where she uh, was um, put on their major gifts initiative there. And um, joining April, who's down here at the moment, Amy Clark Hathaway, and um, also Lauren Wiggs, whom you know. And together, they form a unit. April's our executive director of development, Lauren is major gifts and Clark is uh, annual funding. So we have a gift officer team that is specialized in each of those lines of business and really positions us, positions us well for the coming coordinate camp, uh, capital campaign. So, yep. And April, would you like to stand up and greet everybody? Or? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yes, welcome. Hello, April. It's an opportunity to meet with you all. I'm looking forward to the upcoming campaign, and this is such an inspiring time to be on board. So looking forward to working with you. We're glad to have you. Thank you. Happy to have you. Uh, 
The second item is that we're also getting ready to post uh, the position for the Director of Communications. Um, there's a great need um, in that space across a lot of different areas and foundation in particular, but a lot of different areas within the school. Um, and so uh, we've shifted and kind of readjusted with having different folks take pieces of that role, uh, but there's lots to do and there's definitely a need for the Director of Communications to come on board and hit the ground running. So Brock will be posting that um, as soon as possible uh, within the next week or less um, yes, to get that done. And also, uh, not with us at the moment, but Sophie Williams has been our interim director for the last few months and has done a great job. So if you could see her do uh, Absolutely. her work. Absolutely. And then the third, last but not least, April uh, mentioned it, uh, we're getting geared up for a comprehensive and a holistic campaign, uh, capital campaign, and that is exciting. Um, and we are just looking forward to engaging all of the board in, in this huge uh, undertaking. Um, it is going to be fabulous and um, just very, very excited about it and just need all hands on deck to really make it extremely successful. As, as we've heard, there's lots of needs um, to be filled on both campuses. So this is going to, you're going to hear more and more about that uh, in the coming weeks and, and months and certainly at the board meetings. Any questions? That's it. Thank you, Very good. Eric, how about EPPC? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so our, we had our first meeting of the year on Tuesday, and I'd also like to take a moment uh, to recognize Eric Trone. I think Eric left. Um, but, okay, so Eric is, the, is a new member to EPPC, and he was able to join us on Tuesday. Uh, I'll try to just hit the highlights. We basically talk in our committee in four areas. Uh, one is the faculty senate update that uh, Ashton usually gives, and uh, the one thing that came out of that that I found interesting this time is that there's faculty senate has been working with the Academic Honesty Council on a way to demonstrate for students in a very tangible uh, and in this case visual way about how much collaboration, how much teamwork is allowed on certain projects. And so Academic Honesty uh, brought forth a recommendation to the Faculty Senate, but the Faculty Senate was not entirely convinced of that particular, there, there were still some questions, so they did not endorse that proposal at this time. Is that accurate, Ashton? To... It is, and it was more because having a color-coded system that would imply what you could or could not do, a lot of people would choose the fuzzy gray option uh, for a lot of it, and so it kind of outlined more how we have to explain to the students about what appropriate communication, collaboration, citation, and all those different aspects, and it, in some ways it did open the conversation up a little bit better, and so we have more work to do. Um, we also got a staff senate report from Crystal, and uh, at this time they have now added EHRA staff to the staff senate, which had not been done previously, and so now they um, are looking at their concerns for this year, items of interest to, to discuss, and the top three that came out of that were professional development opportunities, uh, cultural diversity, training for the staff, and what I thought was interesting, and we spent a good deal of time in the committee talking about, was mental health support for staff. We spend an awful lot of time talking about it in relation to our students, but don't spend enough time talking about it maybe in relation to our staff. So I thought that was a good conversation to have in our committee. Um, Katie gave us an update on how the school year is off to a great start. Um, admissions program will open on October 15th. Uh, so far they've visited, I think, I think I got the number right, there was 155 uh, visits that they've made so far. Um, and counting. And counting, yes. Um, the family day went well, STEM Hall of Fame was great, uh, it was a, a fantastic event, so everything has gone well in that regard. Um, and then from Terry, uh, we got our student life report, and I think the, the biggest things to come out of this were that uh, I thought some things changed a little bit around college day this year. We had a successful college day on the 22nd, which was also the day of the, um, of the gala, but uh, they rolled in a a financial aid seminar on Saturday during family weekend and they said it was actually better attended by having it uh, that way so something they may want to consider. Uh, Lori Hackney talked about the fact that we have a uh, intern in counseling to give them some help for 24 hours a week and then Terry just kind of updated us on the um, the cultural uh, campus culture climate and diversity council which we now know is referred to as 3CDC <laughs> so, um, and so uh, and it just took the make, the make a makeup of that it's 15 employees and 15 students and they're going to focus on a deep dive of their assessment and their program and training for this year so that was the highlights of our meeting. Yeah.
Questions and comments for Eric and EPPC Ashton? Oh, no, no, the faculty seem to be a part of that diversity training as well. Uh, the faculty? The faculty absolutely need to be a part of it. That's actually the diversity training. One of the character points because one of the primary things that that committee, 3C, DC, is, uh, has on their agenda is to, to, to plan out that community wide uh, diversity training, um, mm -hmm. which is, you, you know, there's a lot of things that you may do as the whole community, adults and students, and then there's some that may be targeted specifically to different, uh, different members of the community. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, that, that is one of our goals this year is to develop that. And not just develop a one-time only training, but something that is something that's ongoing and people are essentially uh, adding to their toolkits on the on annual. Anything else for EPPC? Thank you. Um, Mark Morgan has been called away professionally, and um, I was fortunate to be able to join the FAHR committee for their. Um, call meeting on the 19th of September, so I'm going to hit the highlights of the meeting. And um, first, um, he and Colin have hit the mother load with three new FAHR members that have joined them with new board of trustees. Uh, we've got uh, Robert and Geneva and Burl, Burl who have joined uh, the FAHR, which is great. Um, that committee uh, has been a good, strong committee, but having some additional members from the trustees is great. So thank you to each of the new members from uh, Committee Chair Morgan as well. Um, with it being the first meeting of the year, um, Robert and his team, uh, Joyce and others, Leah, took the opportunity to use that kind of as a new member board orientation as well. And one of the things that great that that committee has done is they've got kind of a quarterly calendar of major and special reports that kind of come up a kind of a year in review so they took a chance to opportunity to go through and, and highlight um, those documents that, that are in there very helpful uh, as far as routine updates and report um, Joyce Bonney the chief uh, the school's chief audit officer uh, gave an activity report on the audit. This information is all in your materials that you received uh, prior to the meeting from the 2016-17 uh, year and where really each one of those uh, internal audit items stands in terms of completion, continuation, or no longer needed. Uh, Leah Engelbright, the Director of Budget and Finance, presented the school's financial report as of June 30th and discussed the status of the school's cash basis, receipts, and spending for the 2017 year. Everything Again, as you can see in that report, is uh, in line with what was expected, uh, including the carryover funds from the General Assembly's special allocation for the Western Campus. Um, Leah also presented the famous UNC FIT report, the green, red, blue, or the green, the green, yellow, red report, and um, with. Uh, some key staff positions having been filled. Uh, great progress has been made there and they're um, in good shape now of uh, meeting the targeted dates and turnaround times for reconciling bank statements and everything else. So that was a, a very positive update um, with uh, the new staff folks that have been um, hired. Gary Covington uh, was also with the group, the director of plant facilities, and provided an update on the school's various construction and renovation projects. Again, that document is inside your materials. It shows the percent of completion, what projects are there. Some of them are carryover projects where they were waiting for additional R&R &R money to, to complete them. I think the big one is the Hunt roof replacement, I think, is moving forward and, and on track, and that's uh, a very positive thing um, relative to uh, the repair and renovations. Uh, our new board members did hear that we have about $40 million of um, unmet needs and repairs and renovations on the Durham campus that continues to be a priority um, for the school. Um, in terms of the action items, uh, the committee reviewed and discussed uh, the proposed um, projects for the internal audit plan for this coming fiscal year. That is one of your consent agenda items that the committee's brought forward. Uh, they also reviewed um, the two proposed salary increase um, schedules for 2017, including the updated faculty salary schedule, as well as the schedule of EHRA non-faculty salary increases. Um, when I finish my report, I'm going to ask for a motion 
to move the EHRA salary schedule that's not on the consent agenda item right now to the consent agenda item. Um, so we'll uh, um, come back to that. Uh, they all comply with uh, the legislative increases and the Chancellor had done a cover memo with that document that came to us as board members uh, explaining uh, the, the changes there with, I think, the each, each group, uh, an average proposed increase around 2.86% for the faculty and 2.9% for the EHR is kind of the non-faculty is kind of the bottom line. And again, all of those items are on the um, consent agenda item. That's the highlight of the committee report. I don't know if there's any changes or additions from any members of the committee. Yes. There was one change made at subsequent to our meeting. One change in the salary schedule, the salary schedule. that, that was changed. One that was not eligible or something. Yeah, there was an employee who was hired after July 1, and so they're not eligible for the increase, which that modification was made to uh, to the increase sheet that was the, the committee had looked at and actually lowered the amount of money um, necessary. For the and that communication that you sent out was also in the attached, I know I read it, I don't remember, it was in the board packet. to the FAR committee. So it went to the FAR committee, so thank you, Geneva. Very good. So, um, before we see if there's any other questions, could I first ask for a motion to add to the consent agenda item the uh, approval of the EHRA um, salary schedule? So Page motion Second. seconded by Eric. All those in favor say aye. 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 That will be now a consent agenda item. Other comments from the committee? <coughs> Mark regret that he couldn't be here, but he will see us the next time. Um, with that said, we're going to move to the consent agenda items that are listed there for you. Um, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items by so Eric, so seconded so. by Alan. Any discussion on the consent items? Hence, their consent items. All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Mr. Chancellor. It's your Ooh, gosh, yes. yes. Oh, we did leave that out. The not the big one. <laughs> we did leave that one out. Thank, thank that you. is yours. Thank you, <laughs> Ms. Eric, for chairing uh, the nominating committee for us. And uh, I'll let Eric give the nominating committee a report. So we did, uh, the nominating committee met as we've discussed today. That, you know, we're sad that Marjorie will be leaving us, but mm -hmm. that leaves us with a vacancy as the vice chair. And so uh, the board was asked to put forth names and one name was put forward and that was Tom Looney. So the nominating committee discussed it um, when we met, I don't remember the exact date. Um, the 19th. The 19th. And uh, that name was unanimously approved. So the nominating committee will now put forth uh, the vote for Tom to assume the vice chair. You have a motion coming from the nominating committee to approve Tom Looney to be the new vice chair, not to take Marge's so place, but to do right. that you make that motion. Even though I really don't want me to do that. I know we're taking Marge's place. Sure, I would love for Tom to um, be the new vice chair. Motion's been made. Seconded? Second. Second by Lisa. All those that want to discuss it, Tom will be great, right? Yeah. Right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, yes. I'm allowed to vote if I were right. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Chancellor. Yeah, yeah. that's true. You know, so. All right. And so I will now uh, go to get to my report. Um, and before I get into the slides that we have, uh, each of these meetings we have, uh, provide you with uh, an update on what some of our students, faculty, staff, and alumni are accomplishing. So you have that with you, the accolades and awards document. And again, this is as much as anything to, to just to be a sample of what happens at the school and what, what goes on, what accomplishments happen. Also, to arm you with some information that you can share about the school, about the community. Draw your attention to one item on the very last page, the back of that back page is 
One of our uh, own uh, trustees was our speaker at our convocation this year. Uh, Jamar Bennett spoke um, at our convocation and uh, did a fantastic job. Um, it, would, it, it, you know, it couldn't have, we obviously couldn't foretell the future, so that we, we didn't plan it this way, but it was uh, our convocation happened right on the heels of events in Charlottesville and with Jabbar's role at Northwestern and, and what he does for in providing leadership around uh, diversity for that campus. I mean, it was uh, it was well-timed. His, his uh, speech was, was fantastic, and so it was a, a great way, quite frankly, to start the school, and so um, give a, a, a lot of kudos to uh, Jabbar for, for that, so um, just wanted to point that out to you. So I'll, I'll just uh, hop into to, to my presentation and, and try to cover a few things about the start of the school, um, highlight uh, some more than others, uh, but if questions uh, arise on any, stop me and I'll, I'll spend more time on it. Again, uh, you already hit this, but about the summer programs, this was our um, uh, most students served ever in, in uh, total numbers as well as the number of different programs um, and as was mentioned we branched out to another campus and and you know if you think about in the strategic plan back in 2012 when this idea of running uh, revenue generating summer programs came about um, that was just an idea and then you know we had the opportunity with Ma Melissa and her team bringing on Jen uh, and Jen's now brought on Julia and you know we they created a, a, a small business uh, at that mm -hmm. time and you know we're not in the business of creating businesses but we have done an unbelievably good job under under Jen's leadership and so if you just look at the the results and, and part of the goal of this starting this program was to uh, help make our summer programs as a whole self-sufficient and you know have these programs help fund the programs that we run um, that you see the long list up here that, that are, are, are either grant funded or serve our unique mission of outreach into the school where we talked a little bit about onboarding students like the summer bridge and summer leadership programs uh, and so we're on our way to, to being able to do that and as a matter of fact this year proceeds from last year's um, uh, summer accelerator helped to fund the, um, the student leadership and or step up STEM, I believe it was uh, program which uh, serves rising ninth grade underrepresented minority students who are talented in STEM. And so, as you can see from the results from this year, uh, we're, we're well on our way to being able to even do more than that. And, and so, I don't know if Jen wants to make any comments at all about this or anyone else or Paige. Uh, I just think it's worthy of note that we've had a ten and a half times increase in four years for this small business, and I think anybody who's in small business <laughs> would love to see that kind of growth yeah. in their endeavors. So I, I'm just so proud of what Jen's been able to accomplish with the support of the school, and I think the potential here is really endless. Yeah. And it's very, very exciting for, for NCSSF. It is. It's, it, thank you for putting it that way. That was a great way to put it. <laughs> well, we're all happy. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, and, 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 and so, and even beyond that, I think it's it's helped to uh, expose students to NCSSF who. Uh, now think about enrolling in the school and applying for the school and, and those programs. And, and so, as a matter of fact, um, uh, I believe Eric's. Uh, one of his kids came to the accelerator program uh, this year and was looking already looking forward to next year. I don't know if, uh, if you guys want to say anything or not. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, besides you know having sort of a headline for our students get introduced to us, it also demonstrated this year that Barnes for Bard that we can provide quality programs outside of Durham. So I think it's a good education one, and we'll be able to start off things here at a the practice we have. Yeah, great. So it's been it's been been a, a huge uh, huge success in, in many ways for, for the school. So just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, actually. just adding a I teach in accelerator is a fantastic opportunity. I very much enjoyed it. But always keep in mind is we're adding more a lot of these things, and some things like IT was pushing to doing a lot of things to fix computers, get people all these accounts, take them off. Uh, they weren't able to necessarily do as much work on focus as they were planning, and so it's, our success breeds new opportunities and so uh, but always just keeping in mind that there's a pressure on staff that is not uh, felt on faculty in the same way and all that and so how to always keep that in mind as we grow uh, and I'm glad we're going off site for some stuff too that's exciting uh, but the excitement is, is how do we do it as well as we can and I know there has been a lot of accommodations to help with staff in the 
spread that out a bit, but have, just always keep that in mind that it is a change uh, that we're growing into of, of what the summer workflow is. And so I, I'm always going to bring that up. Yeah, great. In right on cue, I know when he raised the hand, I said, I'm attacking time. I can't say what I know what that's doing. Uh, uh, many, but it actually is exactly right. I mean, it, it is logistically challenging, you know, because we do work in the summer to the facility and, and our facilities team. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, Sarah Shoemaker, who's not here, who coordinates our summer research program, which this year was double the number of kids had that opportunity than in the past. And she helped coordinate with Mike Neubauer and our student life a, a celebration of our facilities and housekeeping staff uh, just the, this week uh, for their for their work because it really does put extra on uh, them. But now we do bring in extra cleaning crews that contract to come in and then take some of that load off. But they have to. They're all summer long, you know, shuffling one hall to the next as we bring in, because you don't bring in one group of students um, and have them come into a room. Some other just group of students just left without cleaning it. So there's a lot of logistical challenges. And one other benefit that I think that often doesn't get mentioned for the summer programs is the opportunity for those members of our faculty and staff who are not working in the summer typically that might want to to have those opportunities like Ashton said to work and maybe teach a new course or something that they're interested in doing and also to, to earn additional income um, which is um, a great opportunity for them as well which most of the, I would I don't know say most but probably 75 percent of the folks that work in our summer programs are um, faculty or staff at the school so, yeah Can I was just comment and add to what Ashley was saying. One, we put all of our committee documents in front of you all, so we came back from lunch, you saw that. So you'll see a detailed report that Jen was able to pull together at the end of the summer that shows um, when we saw there were pressure points that we never saw last year, like with IT, we provided money from summer to other to have IT hire an additional person. So that did not add on to IT in any um, you know, unexpected type of way. Also in there, you'll be able to see the exact amount of money that's being reinvested in our faculty. So how much money um, faculty members who are teaching classes in the summer are able to add on top of their salaries, as well as alumni. We hire a great deal of alumni over the summer to service. So we're supporting housekeeping by giving them additional funds per student than they normally would accept by a residential student because we know that we're putting those added pressures on. So, um, you know, Jen makes it very clear that not only in, in verbal appreciation, but in trying to use that money to reinvest that back in the school, both in programs and in faculty and in departments. So we see the pressure. And then we also have a great opportunity with the director who is going to hopefully alleviate one of our largest burdens, which is our hiring so many contracted people over the summer, is that she has us looking at a system that will enable us to work with an outside entity to be able to do that. It will help take some of the pressures off the HR and the business office as well. Thanks for pointing. Right. Uh, and then just to add a few <coughs> photos from the summer, you know, kids doing various things on campus, off campus. The students in the top left were uh, in China competing in a competition, and humanities research on the right, and kids up in Appalachian State uh, for the sustainability conference. So they were on campus and all over uh, doing interesting things. And then I mentioned, um, in thinking about the start of the school year, just a couple of photos. And there's, uh, I jumped the gun on my comments, there's Jabbar right up there at Convocation. Uh, and those photos were all from Convocation, which was a, a great way to start the school year. And then this fabulous and once in a lifetime, maybe, kind of opportunity of experiencing the solar eclipse, um, which was uh, academic programs um, did a, a, an amazing job of planning activities on campus for <laughs> our students and I think they bought like 900 and some pairs of viewing glasses and so we had the whole community out um, uh, watching the eclipse and I'll have to say from a personal standpoint 
it exceeded expectations. I thought it was going to be more hype than cool, and it was cool than hype. Uh, for sure, I really was was amazed by the experience. And as you can see, look at this moose. She was too. Uh, so somebody captured that amazing photo. So it was a, it was a really a special win. kind of a new way to, to start the, the, the school year. Um, so leading into that, um, you know, the you know we we would be nothing without our students because that's what we do. And so they they moved in, as you can see, and um, are off to uh, a good start. And just to give you a, an overview of of you know the admissions process, you know, we're we're already talking about. The class of uh, 2020 at this point, but um, the class of 2019 is just settling in. So I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Rob Andrews and Katie O'Connor. If they have any, uh, if Katie wants to add to it, they're going to sort of walk us through these slides about the, you know, both the process because there's been um, some change by necessity. Uh, obviously, as you know, uh, Dr. Mason um, left to take an opportunity down in South Carolina, which we we greatly miss her. But you know, Rob and the team have stepped up and. And, and, and are taking the opportunity to think about what we do as well, which is which has been great. So I'll turn it over to Katie and Rob. So I'll just give a, a quick update before Rob takes over the slides, just to let you know that um, you know we uh, missed Latita terribly, and uh, we are, as uh, Chancellor Roberts just mentioned, the, the admissions team has hopped on board, and they are doing an amazing job, and um, which you'll hear about. Um, I also wanted to let you know that. You, you might have heard this already, but our registrar, Kathleen Allen, and the assistant registrar, Wanda Munn, they are both retiring December 31st. So um, after I got up off the floor <laughs> uh, and was able to you know, process all this information, um, so one thing that this, we are trying to look at this as um, an opportunity and to really look at the um, what the registrar's office does, what admissions does, see if there's already things that they do together, see if there's other synergy that can happen. And um, I'm really grateful to our new HR director, Carla. Um, she is doing something called a desk audit. So we have given her uh, 12 positions of folks in those areas, and um, actually one or two positions in DEEP, because DEEP has a position that not called a registrar, but acts like a registrar. So she's looking at all those positions and she's going to give us a recommendation or two just to see are we being most efficient. And as we move toward Morganton, what are some things we maybe we should be looking at uh, a different structure and so forth. So that's currently happening and that's why you haven't seen Latina's position filled so quickly. We're just taking it a little slower especially knowing what's coming in December with Kathleen and Wanda moving toward retirement, um, just to see what, what are some creative ways we might be able to um, move forward in the uh, registrar area, the admissions area, potentially an enrollment services area, and, and, and include online. So, um, so we'll, you know, once we get a plan, of course, we will we'll update you and you will see positions posted. But that's where we're at right now. And I just wanted to, to let you know that we're, we haven't forgotten to post it, but we're just um, doing some behind the scenes thinking about it right now. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rob to, so he can talk to you about what um, the team's been working on. Thank you. And recruitment has begun. Actually, um, Ms. Gaddy Parks is in Berkey County today, and Andrew is in um, Harnett County, and I've been out here in uh, the uh, western area. Everything west of here is already covered. It's in those 155 <coughs> schools in 48 counties. So we are moving forward. Um, we didn't miss a beat as far as recruitment has been concerned. Uh, we got on the road the last week of August and have been visiting schools. Um, it does require one of us to be in the office a little bit more to cover some of the roles and responsibilities of the meetings and things with Latita. Uh, but we're very excited about you know the chance to see where our division can grow. And she she really did a great job of preparing us you know uh, for when she wasn't going to be here any longer. <laughs> Um, so if we can look at the next, we got some numbers for you guys. Well, first of all, with our programs this year, uh, we do have four open houses, well, three open houses for our high school applicants. Uh, these are informational programs where faculty and staff do presentations. We cover the admissions process, and then there's a tour at the end of the program. 
Uh, we'll also have a um, middle school open house, which is February 3rd, and that will correspond in with the Native American powwow that afternoon. So all participants who come to the morning program get free admission to the powwow. Uh, we are already reaching out and uh, getting those vendors for the powwow, we have dancers, we have drummers, and really looking at how we can revamp the powwow moving forward um, to include Native American recruitment here in North Carolina. Uh, Discovery Day schedule, all applicants, um, if you don't know, must attend. If you're a resident or applicant, you must come to a Discovery Day uh, where you get an information session, you get a tour of campus, but there's also that math test that is part of the admissions process. Uh, so we will have three uh, Discovery Days, two sessions each day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, uh, where they will test and uh, we will bring all our applicants to campus during that time period. Once selection is done, the selection committee will meet the last month or last week of March this year. Uh, review applications. Notification will be the first week of April, and then uh, the students will come. The first welcome day is the main welcome day. Last year, for the first time, we did our makeup welcome day rather than doing it on a weekday. Uh, we took another Saturday to have a second uh, welcome day for students who couldn't make the first welcome day. The second welcome day is also generally when the waitlist students will come. Um, because you know, at that point, you know, we want them to come in, be able to do the testing, and we really try to make the day as welcoming and accommodating for both groups. And that's you know, a tough process because you have one group who's you know, super excited for the finalists, and you have the other group who are cautious. Um, you know, they're a little disappointed they weren't finalists, but they, you know, are still excited that they potentially could be finalists. So we'll bring one on that day. Um, we do have a goal with the, um, you know, strategic plan of increasing enrollment for students from rural and uh, low wealth communities. This has actually been something we've been doing before this was even a goal. Uh, we've always tried to reach out to those communities, whether it is through the high school recruitment, um, middle school recruitment. We are actually hitting um, twice as many middle schools now than we did five years ago uh, to try to not only prepare those students for our process, but the college process in general. Uh, we look at it as a chance to do outreach, and even if a student decides in the 10th grade they're not going to apply to one of our programs, we want them to be preparing for college at that point. Um, and that's something um, Latita instilled in us before you know, she left. Um, that was always one of our missions was how can we give back to these communities even if they don't apply to the School of Science and Math. So a lot of those middle school programs are 50% science and math, 50% preparing for college. Um, we targeted uh, different presentations towards underdeserved or under uh, deserved and underrepresented schools. Um, and you know, try to increase that outreach. If you have programs that you want us to come into in your home communities, um, whether that's a scouting program, a church program, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to come to your area and speak to those students. Um, many of the board members have been fantastic in supporting. Um, Paige has you know, helped me so much in um, Transylvania County, uh, reaching out not only to the public schools, even to some of the other programs there. Um, so we, we've had that support um, in the past. New partnerships, we're starting a lot of new programs um, to try to reach out to these students. So through the Burroughs Welcome, um, outreach to Edgecombe, Howell fans and Vax, uh, fans and Warren. Um, this guy parts just last week was at the Hawassi Pony um, uh, Tribal School. It is a charter school in Warren County where she went and spoke to the students. Uh, you know, we're uh, collaboration with Black Unicorns. It's a new thing that uh, we are starting with uh, some of our uh, African American alumni um, that Maddie has, has kind of put together. Uh, working and mentoring with local organizations. So not only do admissions go out and do presentations, we're actually volunteering in the community, uh, doing outreach through some of the uh, community organizations in the Durham area, especially those that reach uh, Hispanic populations and some of our underwork. Um, represented populations in the local area. And then also uh, potential collaboration with Black Girls Who Code. Um, this goes along with some of the other programs we've been doing, like WAM um, in the area, and some other things that we've done throughout the years. Um, and that's going building on established relationships, revitalizing the powwow, like I mentioned earlier, during that middle school open house. And we're actually going to reestablish the Native American Advisory Council. And this was something that many years ago we had at Science and Math, um, led by Joe Lyles, 
and was you know, instrumental in getting into those communities and getting students from those communities. So we're going to be um, inviting some of our uh, former alumni um, that are in North Carolina to come back and help us plan the powwow, help us reach out to those communities, try to get communities we might not have reached before, um, especially like in the western part of the state, the um, Cherokee Nation. Uh, we're, we're actually trying some things to get um, onto their travel schools and getting into some of their programs. Um, also brainstorming new st uh, strategies, which is something we do all the time. Uh, this summer we actually came out to Morganton and, and looked at the Western, uh, you know, looked at the School of Death, looked at the Morganton uh, potential campus, and we had a retreat out here, and you know, just trying to um, work with deep on different strategies and how we can reach more students uh, during the course of the year. We can, at this point, visit every middle school and high school. We really try as hard as we can. But with scheduling, with storms, um, you know, actually had a delay two weeks ago. I missed three schools in Buncombe County because they were closed with the hurricane when it came up through uh, Western North Carolina. So anything we can do, uh, we try to, you know, uh, we're trying to do strategies. Right now, 680 residential students, 360 online. Uh, so that's a total of, um, you know, 1,040 students. Um, and then we have the IBC enrollment, of course, through D. Um, for this fall and the spring. We also try to use IBC if we can for recruitment um, to do presentations. It's funny, I actually went into a school um, last fall and they asked me to come into this room and it's just uh, Jamie Latham wanted to say hello to me. He was teaching a class um, at West Iredell. Um, so I went in and said hi to Jamie and the student. Um, and that happens to us every once in a while. We'll, we'll have that happen. We'll be having an IBC class when we're going into the school. Uh, we do have 93 out of 100 counties represented uh, within the two programs. Um, that is not what we want as an admissions office. We really every year have the goal of 100 counties and, and have at least a student from every county. That has not happened in my 16 years of admissions, and that's something I want to accomplish before I leave someday. Um, and, and many of those counties actually, uh, I've been fortunate enough to go to all 100 counties in my 16 years, so it's really something we would love to see. And I think with the addition to the Morganton campus, I think that's something we'll probably accomplish um, with the Morganton campus. Right. Yeah. Uh, of those seven counties that we didn't have this year, how, over your 16 years, how many assistants have the ones um, that you have? Two of them are like, so. Grand County, we've had one student in 16 years, and that's Robbinsville. And it's not for a lack of trying. Um, their counselor actually has a pizza party and invites the top 15 to 20 students in the class to the pizza party. And I talked about the school, I talked about recruitment, you know, I talked about all the different options. And, um, you know, students leave excited, but what it is, it's a very tight knit community. Um, if you've ever been to Robbinsville, it's a little bit more secluded even than Murphy. You know, it's a little closer to us than Murphy. It's in kind of a, you know, geographic area where, you know, they're kind of nestled in a nice little valley there. And um, the one student that we had uh, from Robbinsville, their parents moved two years before from Atlanta. So they weren't bought into the community. You know, they were, they were transplants within that community. Uh, Green County is the other county that cons consistently uh, not represented. And there's many factors. Um, but Green County is one of Maddie's counties. And um, we just traditionally, if you look at the entire 38 history here of the school, uh, Green County and Graham County normally show up. The other counties are kind of hit or miss as well. Um, I am proud to say districts 10 and districts 11 in the mountains. Um, Graham is the only one we don't have represented in Western North Carolina. Um, and one thing, when we, before we go through the numbers, the numbers you'll see are the numbers on campus today. Uh, when we did initial selection this year, we're mandated 4 to 11%. Uh, for each congressional district. We actually selected 6 to 10 percent. So that means we didn't hit minimum in any district, we didn't hit maximum in any district because overall the application pool this year was very strong. Um, also with the online program, um, in years past, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the, uh, the online students, that would be their second choice. This year that was, I don't think any, um, in the initial selection. Um, so, you know, here's the residential numbers, and you can see these are reflected after bringing in students off the wait list. Um, but this is the first year we've used this congressional district map. Um, as you know, the maps 
come and go <laughs> uh, with the politics of North Carolina. And um, one thing to highlight is, yes, District 4 is still the, you know, Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill, 300 applications, you know, you're going to have, you know, the upper 30s. District 1 has 37 students. That is, you know, mainly Northeastern North Carolina. Northern Durham is also in there and well represented within there. Um, but some of the other districts, District 3, uh, very strong on the coast as well. Like I said, Districts 10 and 11, 27 and 25, we're actually closer to 30 in the initial selection. So some of those students, when they get ready to enroll, being further away from home, those are the students that, that might decline, and there is a decline survey, uh, or decline numbers later on with them. Um, so we were very proud of the numbers this year. This is the online class. So you can see well represented um, pretty much throughout the state. District 9 down a little bit. District 9 is uh, Mecklenburg and then kind of rolling all the way over to Clayton. Not as many applicants for the online program um, in that district, but um, still good numbers statewide within the online um, for this year. And this is the re um, residential declines, like I said. Um, not many declines um, throughout the process. Uh, this year, for the first time, we actually um, shortened our wait list. Um, in the past, we would do 45 males and 45 females. This year, it was um, in the mid-30s for the wait list because we weren't, we don't like to set students up for disappointment. You know, we're not creating a wait list as a consolation prize. Um, we tell applicants that when we go over applications with them after the process. Uh, we do try to do reviews for those students who did not get in. Um, sometimes it's very hard in District 4. You have a 750, 750 on the SAT and straight A's, and you know, but there's there's just not enough space. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are the online declines. Again, this is down a lot lower. We had um, very few declines within the online program. And I really want to attribute that to the distance education department and to some of the initiatives we made. Uh, we now have online student ambassadors. Um, so if you're in your community and you see a more of a Duke Blue t-shirt with, uh, with the, the catalyst on it, they are an online ambassador with 30 statewide. Uh, we're in the process of selecting this year's junior online ambassadors. This week I saw three in Henderson County that came to my presentations and talked to <laughs> students. So seeing those students in the community um, even when I went into one school this um, two weeks ago, I saw three NCSSM t-shirts throughout the school that were online students that came to the presentations to encourage fellow students to apply to the online program. So they're, they're uh, really helping us in, in promoting the school. Um, these are the congressional district trends. Uh, one thing to note again is these districts have changed. Yeah. Um, I will tell you, we have students in Moore County doing backflips because they were no longer competing with Wake County in District 2. Um, you know, so with some of the districts changing, I will say, um, as a non-political thing, uh, these districts really do have a much greater representation. We used to have that weird, strange river of District 12 that ran from Mecklenburg County to Greensboro. Uh, and that district was always very low application on it, um, generally in the 30s or 40s. Now District 12 has kind of sunk into Mecklenburg County, this is Northern Mecklenburg County, and we had 60 some applications from Northern Mecklenburg yes. County this year. We now call that the Congressional District of Mecklenburg. Yes. <laughs> just, just, just Mecklenburg County. <laughs> All right, now. And um, our right now. Additions is, um, the additions is for the last, right. since, since I've been assigned to Mecklenburg County, has been the number one representative right. county on campus. Right. That will no longer be the case in two years. Mm -hmm. um, because of that congressional district, because Mecklenburg is still so strong in nine, and now Lake is competing with Orange again, um, Mecklenburg will be our most represented county. Mm -hmm. You can see exactly what Rob is talking about, particularly on this if you look at your congressional district 12, a huge increase uh, in congressional districts 13 and 2 large decreases Decrease. because they yeah. used to be, um, White County used to be in 2, 13, mm -hmm. uh, and 4, and now they're almost all in 4. So you can see the number of applicants decline and the enrollment decline from those, you know, once White County's pulled out of that. Now, as Rob indicated, the total number of students went down, but the diversity of where those students are coming from is up mm -hmm. because it's not... All mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And these are some of our enrollment tents ethnicity-wise. We're very excited that over the last two years, our um, you know, African American numbers have come up. Now, the way we record numbers compared to the past, we have a lot more that are multiple or refused. Um, so those students could be within any of these different lines. Um, of course, our Hispanic numbers are up again. Um, actually, um, Asian American numbers are down a little bit. Um, you know, so there is a little bit more uh, diversity within these classes, and also attributes again to summer programs and you know just the exposure we have with students in those communities and trying to reach out to those communities. And this is the online enrollment um, per congressional district. So you can see, like the chancellor mentioned, District 13 went way down because of how the district was redrawn. Um, but you know, a lot of our districts. Districts two, District three on the coast is, you know, a large number of our online students where those students are really looking for more opportunities. And I can really, you know, talking to some students already, I have the Northeast. I, I tease everyone, I have the pretty areas in North Carolina. I have the mountains, I have the Northeast, I have the Wilmington area. Uh, so, um, you know, talking to some of those students, some of the programs in Morganton are going to be the programs they're really going to want to come for the ag programs, the sustainability and environmental programs. Um, so I, I can see students leaving, you know, District 3 to come. And this is our online, uh, again, with ethnicity. Um, and again, we've, we've had some increases. Uh, one of the reasons we're looking at revamping that uh, the powwow is to try to get those Native American numbers. Yes. Um, I noticed that District 8 had in, increased sharply. And um, the online program, is there any? Redrawing. Why, but you just think the reason is just redrawing? Absolutely. Moore County and Cabarrus County are now in that district, so you have two very strong. Um, Moore County will send us a, a, a large number of applications, both residential and online. The same thing with Cabarrus. Um, we actually have some charter schools in Cabarrus County, like Lake Mormon Charter. Mm -hmm. They want to be the most represented school at the School of Science and Math. Mm -hmm. um, that is what they've told us. So, you know, um, they invite us in. They promote, and if, if a student does want to do residential and they're a strong student in their class, they're asking them to apply to the online program. Interesting. Um, and it's the same way Lincoln Charter here in District 10. Um, actually, this is both campuses of Lincoln Charter. If you're not familiar, they're one school, but like in CSSM, they have, they're going to have two campuses. They have one in Denver and one in, um, in uh, West uh, uh, Lincolnton. And um, those schools, they use it as a selling point for their school. They can grab the number of students they've had accepted over a certain period of time. Right. Rob, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, and, and Rob, that kid, he's been all over the state of North Carolina multiple times, and so if you never need any tips on where to go, what to do, yeah, I've heard of you. I've heard of you. I've heard of you. I've heard of North Carolina barbecue spot. Yes, that's right. So, uh, thanks, thanks for that. And, um, and, you know, I think probably by December-ish at that meeting, we might have some recommendations uh, around the... Um, what we might be doing in terms of restructuring with um, emissions registrar and how those can, can help each other. So uh, just quickly, you know, the, our legislative priorities that we went into, we talked about in May, what we were hoping for still at that time, and so this is kind of our scorecard, um, if, it is, if, you, if it were, in terms of how things ended up for us. Um, we, uh, um, one I'll point out here, no, no budget reductions again, which is a good thing. The UNC system as a whole was, was mostly spared. Um, one of the things that changed this year uh, at the last minute was how enrollment growth funding is being allocated. Um, it used to be you would submit your request, they would verify it, and the funding would come on the front end. And for us, that was really important because it allowed us then to staff the growth for our distance education programs and oftentimes create those courses to enroll by the spring uh, semester to realize those numbers. And this year they changed and, and you have to now submit your numbers of growth before they'll allocate the funding. So that's made uh, it a little bit challenging for us, um, but our deep folks and academic programs have really worked to, to figure out how we can still realize some of our enrollment growth um, for this first uh, um, fall semester 
and then uh, are planning for the spring semester where we can then verify. So it is a little bit different model for us and, and a little bit more difficult, I think, for us than a lot of the university schools because we don't have the resources to kind of front the funding to establish those courses, assuming the money coming in on the back end. We're trying to do that as best we can now with, with some vacancies that we have uh, to realize that the, the funding that we want to bring in so that we can do more of that next year. R and R funding and capital. There, you know, very over the past number of years, very few capital projects have been funded. R and R funding comes to the university, which was 60 million for our system. And uh, but of that 60 million, about uh, 20 million was pulled out and for specially identified projects, like 10 million for um, a new business school at UNC Pembroke. So not really 60 million is being allocated out to the system as a whole. They have a formula. Our portion of that is a little over a million dollars, as you can see. What we're hoping to try to do in relationship to the uh, Morganton Campus project that we just talked about is that to have, have that be one of those special projects that gets pulled out on the front end um, for this, this next year so that we, we can get that additional $15 million that we were talking about earlier. Uh, we talked about the salary increases um, a little while ago, and then the tuition grant was the other big item that was added in. Um, really at the last minute. It was a priority of the university system. It didn't appear in the House budget. It didn't appear in the Senate budget, but it appeared in the final budget. Uh, and so what it did was allocate $1.5 million in funding for the class of 2018 for one year. So right now it's not recurring. So the class of 2018 who went to the University of North Carolina system schools would get tuition up to $6,000 funded for that one year, 18-19. Now we do uh, expect and are hoping that it will become uh, recurring in this upcoming short session budget. Um, this is still a priority for the UNC system and, and I know they're still working on it. So we're hopeful that uh, in June it would be um, added in so that the class of 2019 would get it and 20 would get it and then the class of 18 it would be recurring on. So just like it was in previous years when we had it. So that's where, that's sort of our scorecard uh, for this past session. And uh, as we talked about um, a little while ago, one of our big needs um, in coming into the short session is not only the funding that we talked about for uh, the campus in Morganton, but the funding for the campus in Durham as well. And, and it was alluded to the $40 million of, of backlog of R&R work in the Durham campus. And we have been uh, making some progress on that in 2015, 17 years, as you can see, we've done about 4.6 million. And that's a combination of a one-time $4 million allocation that helps support the new uh, um, fiber optic network that has been installed as well as some of the IBC studio upgrades and some of the other things that you see right here plus some R&R &R money but we submitted as you recall maybe um, uh, in the for the budget session that we, we we just I gave you the scorecard on we had asked for 20 million uh, 5 million in R&R &R and 15 in capital project money which we got 1 million as you saw so uh, going forward we're still working uh, on some with some funds that we have we're in the process of doing about 4.2 million in renovations which right now our fourth floor physics labs and classrooms has been offline since the summer uh, we have two if you've not been to the campus um, since last May we have two portable classrooms now in the middle of campus um, that are uh, there for us to house physics classes and others because uh, they are uh, totally out of their space until the third trimester because it's being uh, totally 100% renovated just like our engineering uh, class and lab was last year. We're replacing the, dorm, the roof on Hunt dorm. We're going to be replacing our HVAC systems through a performance contract, which is, means essentially that um, uh, we get fronted the money by, um, in this case, Brady Train, who will do the work and upgrade our systems, and then we pay it back over time from the savings that we'll realize um, from uh, improved efficiency. So it's a way for us, a school like us, to, to it's about, um, that's about close to $4 million worth of improvements to our HVAC systems, not only the, the mechanical systems, but the control systems as well. And, and so a way for that we can do that without having to put out $4 million up front that we don't have mm -hmm. uh, to pay it off over time. And then once we pay it off, all the savings accrue back to us from an operating standpoint. And then this summer we'll be um, uh, uh, totally uh, renovating uh, one of our three labs on the chemistry floor, one of our three labs on the biology floor, the uh, organic 
chemistry lab and the biology dissection lab. And part of that is to do, some of it's to do with safety, is ventilation. Um, you know, Ashton can probably tell you about the, the, the biology dissection uh, lab space, but uh, the chemistry as well. And so not only replace the ventilation in those, but also replacing the lab benches and, and, and all of that as well. So that'll be you know, great improvements to, to that space. So we are making progress on some of the $40 million worth of backlog, but um, we're hoping as we, we've had, the, had these conversations as well, and I had some with some of the legislators here yesterday about um, by 2021 when we, we uh, open um, the campus in Morganton, that's the, um, uh, uh, the one that we, the ideal version of that, of the uh, option uh, two version that we saw, talk, saw today. We also want at the same time have uh, dealt with some of the, the uh, most of the improvements we need on the Durham campus, which are our next um, areas of need are the ones we listed and asked for money this past time and you see up here they're the living space renovations so we want to uh, um, renovate the dorm spaces the flooring um, we've been really fortunate thanks to, to terry lynch's work to get about five hundred thousand dollars worth of quote unquote new furniture from duke university uh, it's great furniture for our dorms and rooms and it's new to us um, really new to us compared to what we have uh, but to continue to replace that furniture either through Duke or Purchase, um, but also to totally renovate our bathrooms. I mean, they're, they're long overdue in, in our dorms, and so to make the living spaces better, and also to replace windows. As you can see, the, 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 the middle picture there is a sample of the, the breezeway windows, and you know, they, they're, they're way, way, way overdue for being uh, refurbished or replaced, uh, but we need to do it all over campus, and we've seen the difference when we replaced the windows in the uh, engineering suite last year when we renovated it, it's, it's a night and day difference from an efficiency standpoint as well as the, the aesthetics of it all. And then also to uh, do some of the renovations to these other areas and some safety and security upgrades on the campus. So nothing that you know is as exciting as, um, as building a brand new building necessarily, but um, really important to uh, the, the, the School of Durham. So we're gonna, along the same line of pursuing the funding for the additional funding needed for Wilkinson, we're going along that same line, really trying to, to pursue an equal amount of funding for the Durham campus uh, at that same time. And also, uh, as we move into the capital campaign, um, that may end up being, being something that we are also looking to raise pilot money for as well. So so we're, we're working in the goal being 2021, um, we got two shiny new campuses um, that, that everybody's really excited about. Uh, and then enrollment growth, I just hit on that, so I won't spend uh, any more time on that one in particular. Rob hit on this a little bit um, in some of the goals for admissions, but the university system completed a strategic plan um, really last January, and they're in the implementation phase. And, and I'll say, just based on the conversation thus far, and at the Board of Governor meetings, they are going to be very metric driven in, in uh, their strategic plan and what, and what they're accomplishing. And they're really looking at improving completion, uh, access, and affordability, uh, as well as economic development. And it's hard to see up here, but uh, for your, if you want to see, read the UNC plan, this is the link to it, um, that you have uh, available uh, in your materials online. And then this is our full um, sort of response to the plan. Each campus was asked to look at the system plan and come up with those things that we see as goals for improvement that will tie to the system meeting its goals. So essentially each campus doing their part to help drive those improvements system-wide. And so I'm just gonna hit on, Rob touched on some of these, but we're not, you, you, this is one of those areas that we're, you know, where we're not exactly, you know, a perfect fit for the university system and we don't have the same goals around completion that they do in terms of those types of things. But there are things that we can do. And one of those is uh, what Rob just touched on is around enrollment for us um, and focusing in on um, rural and low wealth uh, counties uh, and enrolling students and our underrepresented minority students at the school. And so these were, as Rob said, goals we were working on, but now we've put very specific metrics to that, uh, that you know, annually we'll be asked to provide information to the system on how well we're doing in accomplishing these metrics. And so, again, this helps to drive, in the UNC system plan, when you look at it, they have a large focus on rural 
and low wealth and underrepresented minority students too, and particularly related to completion. And ours is on the front end, getting them in. Because when we get them in, almost all complete. You know, they do 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 very well, and so it's a it's a it's a, um, a positive thing, Rob. Yeah, and one thing to add is um, our database manager, Lee Buffler, has actually put it in so we can track our presentations and how many students we've seen in each of the tier one, tier two, and tier counties within our admissions database. So, like, anytime we go out, we fill in the numbers, and then that's something we can track and help, you know, keep, keep count of as we're out there um, visiting schools and, and visiting different areas of the state. When you look at the demographics, Try to increase a little. Are, are those two goals consistent or are they pushing against each other? I would say they're consistent. And I have no idea the demographics of where the minority, underrepresented minorities are geographically. Yeah, unfortunately, the one thing we find is some of our strongest um, underrepresented minority students are in some of those most competitive areas. Yeah, that was exactly yeah. my concern. But there are, there are you know, populations within those low tier counties too. Um, especially in those uh, schools that like step up for STEM serves mm -hmm. that we're you know doubling our efforts in um, that we can really you know hit those populations and I think you know not only building relationships with those counselors and those teachers when we're there too so then they're you know trying to get those students and they're helping those students get to us uh, we invite a lot of those teachers and counselors to come to campus um, whether it's on selection committee or through other programs um, so you know I think. I don't think they really butt up against each other. I think there's there's um, room in both of those for us too. And Brad, I want to buy it. Being from Wake County and knowing minority students yeah. in Wake County, and it's hard to tell them to get excited about applying what the number is in the reality. Of Wake yeah. County. Mm -hmm. I feel like we need to hit these children when they're really young. We do. Yeah, absolutely. Because there's certainly a disparity between what rural high schools are doing to prepare these children versus the larger urban schools. And, and it, if anything, I've become far more aware of that in the last four years since being on this board. I think the other challenge I would put forward, though, is that it's great to enroll them, but can we look at the data of actually keeping these children? Because when Rob was up earlier, if you look at the fact that we're enrolling 365 juniors, that would imply a school enrollment of 730 children. <coughs> However, we have 680. Therefore, just anecdotally, we're losing 50 kids. So how does that look? No, that's, that's not. How do, how do you do it? We got somewhere along the line in the history of the school, it got off. Rob can tell you that. And so it, it's not that we lost that many students this past year, somewhere along the history, it, the class previous to that was a was a low enroll, a low number of students, and it's just on a cycle that started somewhere down the line for whatever reason. And it's so not you happening. Can't, happening. Yeah, no, okay. you can't. Okay. Yeah, you can't. Back to 1988, actually, because that's when they built the class. Yeah. Well, and it evened out in the early 2000s, and then when we went through that first period from like 590 students up to 680, you know, they, they renovated some of the spaces, and that's where so, the classes began to be. So, can we look at your enrollment? Could we see if we're what we're actually able to retain here with yeah. demographics because it's you know, it would be really interesting you know when, when you look I mean we're working so hard to get these children there and we want to cultivate them. Do we know how many we lose? We lose? It's, it's, it's around five or six percent is our attrition rate in any given uh, in any given class and, and, and Terry tracks this information so I think what you'll see is that the, the students that end up Leaving the school are uh, often, you know, as a five or six percent is a low attrition rate relative to schools like us in the country, and a lot of those students um, end up leaving more so than not because they make a bad decision, <laughs> and, and there may be something that causes them to leave. But Terry could probably add a little color to that. My three years plus school, I think we typically have somewhere between fifteen to twenty students will draw from the school, a subset of that is students who were brought from the school prior to going through a significant discipline issue. But then there's another subset that is they would like to return to their home high school or they ran into some level of academic uh, difficulty at the school placement from an academic post perspective as well. Um, but what I found is that there's not a larger trend in regards to male versus female or geographic breakdowns at this specific point um, in the three plus years that I've seen and then we've actually tracked that data 
uh, within our division for the last six or seven years, and I think it's spread out um, for a variety of different issues. And, if, and really, if you look at the the, um, the the percentage of students who leave the school who are underrepresented minority, it's a lower percentage than other students uh, uh, at the school. So, so if we can pull the numbers and share share that information with you. But as an example, in a year like last year, where perhaps you may have two or three Native American students withdraw, it feels like this is a significant number because it's a higher percentage of the Native American the total. population yeah. for that particular sure. year. But if you go back four or five years, then perhaps that's not the case. So I think some bigger dive into the data would be helpful. Um, not just on why things lead, but just how they flourish at the school too. Um, do rural students get a chance to take upper level math or science courses while they're there? Do they participate in mentorship at the, at the same level as maybe people from our urban backgrounds? And I think we have some of that data that's out there, but we may just sort of be able to have to collect it or look at it again. But those are things that are just as important as why, um, why students move. And, and I would, to add on to that, is keep in mind that right now our, our school is set up to have students come in at least an hour of the three and then be able to move on. And uh, even as Rob was saying, the successes that they had this year in getting students that were more diverse uh, from where they came and expanding that as we expand by another 300 students, we got to deal with the students from where they come from uh, academically uh, as well as culturally where they come from. And so that will take some time. Math is doing things like having a, an algebra three course that is taught alongside a pre-cal course, which still puts an, an additional burden on the students as far as courses they take, but it gets them caught up to open up access to other courses by the time they reach their senior year. And that's, a, that's an advance they've done, but that isn't necessarily the only solution, but how to make sure that we have enough staff to either be able to treat all the, or teach all the courses we need to, or to revamp the curriculum in both spaces to really accommodate who is the student population we're bringing in, because uh, it can't just be expanding the students that have already come in so well prepared because that's not exactly our mission. It's the students that are going to be, that serve and are going to really achieve here. And so finding that mix is going to be uh, interesting in three or four years. And one thing to note with the numbers is it's not only skewed size wise, but it's skewed gender. Um, this year it's a girl year in our process. We have more female that spaces this year. Last year it was a male, male year. Um, and that goes back to when Royal opened as a dorm and when Hunt was renovated as a dorm. And, and so there, there may be an opportunity when we bring uh, Morgan to campus online to equalize those and to take that opportunity to, to, to look at that because it does from year to year, if you know when you're applying, if you're applying in a year where there's more male spaces, it's tough to be a female applicant that, that year versus the other. So, so you know, it would be good to get it back on. Uh, a track, um, so when it's, it's hard to do now because we would never say, okay, we're going to enroll 20 less kids this year. Yeah. Uh, but when you open up a new mm -hmm. campus, there presents an opportunity to to look at that. So we'll we'll take that opportunity. Uh, economic uh, impact and community engagement. This is another one that we felt like we could contribute to the system wide plan. This is in our strategic plan already. Uh, we. Um, have as one of our goals to increase the number of STEM graduates. Uh, this is a goal of the system as well. That's really why the UNC system was supportive of the tuition grant, was to, but they know that we graduate a higher percentage of our students in, with STEM undergrad degrees than the system as a whole or the nation. And so this is kind of a lagging indicator because, you know, you're, you know, the students are, so we're also looking at metrics that would determine interest in STEM when they come into the school and then survey them when they leave and see how that has changed along the way and, and as a way that we can measure on an annual basis. But the longer term goal is that and we track this through the National Student Clearinghouse. How many of our graduates um, graduate with what degrees um, when they when they uh, graduate with their undergraduate and their graduate degrees? So that's a, a goal that's tied that we can we can do. And the student success is one that they may or may not put this uh, look at this because it was. Um, uh, they have a student success goal in there, but it's not exactly this, but these are things that we, we are working on as a part of our strategic plan, improving um, 
uh, advising, increasing opportunities for students to have real world learning experiences, and as we mentioned earlier, the campus climate, culture, diversity, and mental health uh, activities that are happening on campus is a part of our plan. And so those all three are, um, if you look at the literature, reasons why students um, persevere and, su and succeed is they have those experiences that um, they, they're, that, are, that are engaging and your internships and um, mentorships, the research supports that those keep students persevering in STEM in particular, and then obviously advising and um, wellness on campus are, are two big pieces of that as well. So those are those were the goals that we submitted. Each campus had to submit uh, and, and, and what we were going to do. So this is sort of our metrics that will be measured on by the system as we um, are, are tied to their strategic plan. Uh, and I mentioned ours, these, these tie, I won't spend much time on these, we, we've already talked about this some today, but it ties into the system plan. Our goals around mental health and that work, which our counseling department has been working really close with student government on, on this uh, around mental health. And then we talked a little bit earlier about the uh, Campus Culture, Climate, and Diversity Committee, which is a really important work right now. Um, you know, I think every campus, whether it's a high school campus or a university campus um, in the country, now is is uh, the there are um, uh, just, just a real need to think about how you create the climate on campus that students um, all students feel welcome in an open environment when you can have conversations amongst the folks on campus and um, there's not a day that, that goes by there was I, I was looking at the news this morning and there was an incident on UNC Charlotte's campus just this uh, yesterday and there's so you know it, it and you, you see what happens in the larger uh, community in the world that's going out in the country that we're living in. And so, you know, we have an opportunity to, you know, do our part with um, 680 students and then our online students uh, every day and each year to help try to create the kind of climate and environment that they can be a part of where they can then hopefully not only enjoy and uh, benefit from that while they're two years in Durham, but also when they go to the college campus, they can be a part of the leadership in helping to bring about change um, in the larger communities that they go off to as well. So there's sort of two, two different uh, reasons, both trying to address our own uh, campus climate, making sure it's what we want it to be, but also preparing students for what they're going to be uh, uh, you know, seeing and, and being a part of when they head off to university. Um, and then uh, one thing just to mention, just wanted to, to put this out there, we are in the accreditation process um, this, this uh, uh, year, uh, advanced, it's more than a year, but every five years uh, a team from Advanced Ed, which is you know, our version of the SACS group um, that come to uh, visit the school and, and um, accredit that. Uh, and there's been a lot of work that's been done over the past six months and a whole group of people just went to Greensboro to hear more about it. And uh, Dr. O'Connor and, and uh, a large group of people are involved in this on campus and um, gathering feedback and information from parents from students uh, writing a report and a visiting team will be coming in March to spend two days on campus to see if what we submitted is true or not. Uh, you know, they, they come and say, you know, verify that uh, what we told them is happening uh, is happening on campus. And so we're looking forward to that visit. Katie or Angie, yeah. anything to say yeah, about that? Yeah, we just got back from Greensboro and um, they, because of the five-year cycle, our school happens to land always in year one where they change the process. <laughs> And so we, oh, the year before that happens, we're always waiting to see what the new standards are, the new surveys, and so we have to, you know, get, have our act together really quickly. Um, and the team, our group, has done an excellent job. We did a lot of work over the summer as well. So one thing that I really love about the new change is this time is that it's an improvement journey instead of an event-based journey. And so they're really looking at um, what we do already with our strategic plan, which is like advising. I'll give you as an example. You know, we've had collected data about the advising. We've tried some new things to collect the data about that. Then we've changed things again. And that's what they're looking for. Like, are you constantly trying to improve? And so um, I think that will fit with what we do um, it really well. And um, and so we are looking forward to our visit at um, six people from their team visiting our campus over those two days. Um, because we are, this year is like I said, it's the first cycle of the new way. Um, they typically have 120 schools that are being accredited during a year, and this year it's only 40. Um, and they're 
they've been very, very helpful. Like they want us to call the district office with every question we have because it is the first year. So we are going to be like pioneers through this process. And um, and they've been you know very accommodating to our to our school. They certainly know who we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah. I, I would say, you know, the last visitation um, I think was kind of underwhelming. To, I think to the board and their understanding, the visiting team's understanding of really what our school was, um, maybe their continuous improvement of their continuous improvement model um, will be helpful, but it probably wouldn't hurt for the board to be able to read the last report from the last cycle and kind of see what was in there and, and review that. So. Yeah, and one thing too, we, we brought a team um, to the conference last year, and then the director of this, uh, of, um, Donna James, she actually came to visit with Todd and the team a couple months ago, just so we could give them a, a view since our, our school is so unique. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure that the online and IBC piece was being looked at too, because I think I wasn't here at the last visit, but my understanding is maybe they, they didn't look at the online piece as, well, as much. And, um, and that's just a part of our school as well. So they will be doing that this time. That's great. And um, so we we definitely have made some strides in helping them understand how unique our situation is um, to the point where I think they're going to pick carefully the six people they're sending us. That would be good. Um, because we have the residential piece along. We've got uh, our team includes student life, uh, deep, and academic programs. Very good. Yeah, I think this process is a better process altogether, but it, I think it'll be more closely aligned with, with all, our school, for sure. I've been through that process with um, North Carolina Central and NC State. Are you guys going to have some of the trustees? meet with them that's typically what they request. Yeah, they'll 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 it's it's similar to the, the processes at the university with um with the SACS process. It's a little little different, but they will want to meet with they, they will request who they want to speak with and I'm sure they'll be yeah, yeah. So that that whole they'll visit a lot of classrooms, they'll meet with different groups uh, of stakeholders and so that's all part of the the process. That was sort of the process last time. Then they'll come actually give a report to the, they give a, they, they report out to the whole school they have a session where they report out to whoever wants to come to to a session about what they what they found and so forth and they, then they submit a written report as well um, thank you uh, Katie for that and then uh, one of the last couple of things is um, uh, and I just brought this to your attention because it is the uh, first time ever uh, you know we're 38 years old and Best as anybody can tell, there's nothing archived and the music folks don't know anything about it. Uh, the school's never had an alma mater. And so last year, uh, yeah, last year, um, a student uh, um, from our student student government um, took it, you know, said, okay, we want to alma mater. Uh, and so uh, Gio Leone uh, and um, student government met with our music folks in September and put forth a competition and communicated it out and anybody could submit, uh, alumni, students, parents, random folks uh, could submit uh, uh, for the alma mater and they had that and then they finished up their work um, and they will be debuting uh, this at Alumni Weekend um, at the concert uh, on Friday night and then again at the um, the meeting. So I'm going to, I'm going to sh share with you. You can see the committee. There were students involved. There was our music, uh, our whole fine arts team was involved in the selection. Um, and so all of the submissions were blindly judged. So no names were attached. They, they, the committee judged those. Um, I think we had about nine or ten submissions and lyrics and um, the uh, melody to, to go along with it um, as well. And so the, the lyrics are here, as you can see. Um, and as I did, I guess I should have known this. But I've heard, you know, these things a lot. That uh, like, like sort of the um, national anthem. You don't in the performance. It's never really the whole thing. There's like, uh, like six verses or something like that. And so usually there's a verse that's the one that's uh, the one when they perform. And so I believe that they've they've settled on the first verse will be the one. And there's a link. I'm gonna hopefully it'll work. It's um, uh, you'll be the you'll be actually the very first people to, to, to ever hear it. Um, but we have a real treat here because it just so happens that the um, 
the one of the authors of the alma mater happens to be in the room. Oh, wow. Uh, Great. Wait. <laughs> Emily Martin. Oh, hey, uh, uh, so Emily can tell you this this story, but it, this was a family affair, and she's a, a family of unicorns over there, and um, even uh, even an extended unicorn family participated uh, in this. And again, it was Is that a gag blindly Is that a... blindly judged. And it just so happens it's a perfect time, and it's also perfect because her husband Michael, who's also uh, an alumni. Uh, just happens to be his reunion weekend, so it'll be, um, be, 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 be pretty cool for him. So Emily, what, what would you like to share about this? Um, thank you, Todd. We really enjoyed writing this. It was a multi-generational Martine family um, endeavor. Uh, my husband and I are both alums. We're parents of a senior at the school this year, and none of us are composers, but we knew we had something to say about our school. Um, it's very difficult to get the name of the school in a song. <laughs> so we kind of knew early on um, we wanted it to be about what accepting the greater challenge means kind of at different stages of life. When you're first coming to NCSSM um, upon graduation and then later looking back. Um, and actually one of my favorite lyrics is uh, whatever we have to give was honed within that brief time of the big picture up. <laughs> um, so my 13-year-old son wrote the melody. Um, I kind of helped him with the chord progression. My mother, Janet Fox, who's a, she used to be an education reporter, but she's written a lot of stuff, um, really did most of the lyrics. Um, I kind of had the structure, you know, I gave her the syllables and she wrote it out. So um, I think none of us could have done it alone. We all worked on it together. And my son, who I think is watching this on live stream, cannot wait to hear it uh, performed by actual musicians. Yeah. So. so here we go. Uh, and I think that there'll be a full orchestral version and the chorale doing this on Friday along that weekend. But hopefully this will work. Um, this is a, and, a smaller sample. And you will send those of you who are not going to make it to the alumni weekend link. So we yeah. can stream it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We, we will. We, I hope they're. Email. I, hope they're, 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 I don't know if they'll Future be streaming ring. it, but there'll be video yes. in it for sure. Future ringtones. Absolutely. Uh -huh. <laughs> I want that ringtone for sure. You may have to hear from my machine here. Hopefully. You can't see it here. in the presentation that alma mater is the uh, yeah I can help Kevin, with Kevin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the alma mater the alma mater I got your back, uh, I got your back. <laughs> the alma mater uh, is um, the link where it says alma mater is the link and you can actually watch the YouTube video of the performance um, and then lastly uh, this past Friday we had a, a great uh, NC SSM uh, NC STEM Hall of Fame Gala. This was the first uh, time gala event for us and the sort of inauguration of the NC STEM Hall of Fame. And you can see the uh, four honorees up there, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, 
on your left, that's John Burris, the president, and they are, we're honored for their amazing contribution to STEM education in the state as well as early career scientists. Um, and they um, are the largest single private supporter of NCSSM in our history with more than $3 million given to support the school. Maya Ajmera, who's class of 85, is on the top right, as you can see. Um, you, you all know Maya. She was a board member uh, and finished her term last year and has had amazing uh, varied career. The bottom left uh, is um, Jody Simone, who's coming up to accept the award. And those of you who might know, Joe, Joe was on our foundation board for a period of time, but he is um, an amazing scientist, chemist, um, eminent professor, something something at State and Carolina, and also a, a very successful um, entrepreneur uh, as well. And so he was honored. And I, I, I learned something here the first uh, the first time I heard this about him. And, his first PhD student is Valerie Ashby, who's the, now the Dean of Trinity College at, uh, at Duke University. And she said that, um, that he's one of only 20 people in the history that have been elected to um, uh, all three societies. The, and I won't know them off the top of my head, but there's the Society for you know, Science, Medicine, and whatever. I don't know, I can't the name all. <laughs> Chemistry, yeah. Uh, national Academies for all three different national academies, and he's the only person in uh, one of 20 people in history that have been selected to all three of those academies so it's pretty amazing and then lastly in the far right as you know uh, that's Governor Hunt uh, who has done a lot for STEM and certainly our school and they all were uh, gave very gracious and um, unbelievably uh, great um, acceptance speeches, uh, particularly as it related to uh, NCSSM. And this event was um, uh, really the idea of, of Brad and Deborah Ives, who are, uh, Brad's an alum of the School 82, who's a member of the foundation board, actually Paige's uh, brother. Uh, and they did an unbelievable job, along with Brock and the institutional advancement team, of, of pulling this together. Anytime, the first time you do something is you never know how it's going to turn out. You never know how much work it actually is to do it. And so Brock can, at this point, Brock can really tell you uh, how much work it is, what, what was to do this. But it was exceeded expectations in every way. I mean, we had, we were hoping when we first did this to have, to, to, to plan this to have 200 people attend. We had 300 people attend. We were hoping that we might raise $100,000 from sponsors. We raised more than $150,000 from sponsors. And for those of you, many folks in the room were at the event. Um, it was a really fantastic evening. Um, I, you know, again, it exceeded all of our expectations. Brock, I don't know if you want to say anything to this, but but again, Brock and Deborah uh, in particular did an amazing amount of work to, to make this event a, a, a really a huge, huge success. Brock, well, well, still. Yeah. <laughs> He's still recovering. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it really was a fabulous, fabulous event. With great energy in the room, and um, and you know, couldn't have, couldn't have been any any better. So, thanks for all of you who came and sponsored the event, and um, and we uh, had a lot of old friends there, uh, and then we had a lot of new friends as well, which was which was which was great. So. That really concludes um, uh, my report, and I um, want to again thank uh, all of you for um, your work for our school and the new members who are just joining. Uh, I hope today was educational for you, um, uh, and also I hope it was an opportunity to, to see the quality of folks that you're working with on, on, on the board here, and we're happy to have all of our new members. That, as is the case, the diversity on the board brings a lot of perspective to help us out, and we appreciate your willingness to serve. And again, uh, in particular, thanks for um, uh, helping make the first meeting here in Morganton a uh, huge success. Uh, again, as was mentioned earlier by Stephanie, I believe, you know, this is the, the first meeting in Morganton. Many more to come. Um, and I think it was, uh, again, uh, a transformational day for the school in many ways. And I think you're, you're serving on this board uh, at a time really over the, the next four years between what's happening in Morganton, the capital campaign that's going to be launching um, has, uh, uh, you know, will, will really change the trajectory of this institution. And, uh, and we appreciate your leadership and support in helping, uh, helping us uh, make sure we do it well. Uh, and uh, that, and that um, I know we will. So thank you again for, for, for your, your time and your service.
Thank you, Chancellor. Now, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I think um, we want to give uh, the Chancellor, the staff, all of our uh, constituent groups, the Alumni Association, Foundation Board, Parent Advisory Group, Student Government Association. Let's give them a round of applause for them. And to our community hosts that have been just phenomenal, really since the very beginning of the way they've uh, embraced the school, uh, embraced our current students and staff and future, they've just been uh, tremendous and great things to come. Marjorie, we're not saying goodbye, we're saying we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate Tom Looney stepping in to complete your term as vice chairman. He'll do a fabulous job. And I think from the trustees' um, perspective, um, the new opportunity, the new challenges of what was approved today with the academic vision, uh, the site development, the, the infrastructure, the facility, um, committee chairs. Um, it's important for us to assess our policy responsibilities and we will be thinking about what are the opportunities within our policies that can be more innovative, more supportive. Uh, more aligned with what's becoming uh, an institution with um, one school, two campuses, uh, as well as our DEEP program and our IBC program and outreach. So keep in mind the policy side of that as you, as you see things so that when we come back to our next quarterly meetings and our committee work uh, in between, uh, we're prepared to help um, support what the school needs from a policy perspective as well as helping them uh, secure the kind of resources that we're going to need to make it a great experience for all of our students now and for years to come. I'm delighted to see everybody here today. Um, other than that, Mr. Chancellor, I would be ready to entertain a motion to adjourn unless there are comments from other folks. I would allow, I'd like to see Marjorie have the R on making that last mm -hmm. term of motion. I might crack. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the motion that we adjourn this Second. Seconded by Alan. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Please travel safely. Thank you all. Not too far. Okay.